What's up everybody, Tara Wellman, and I feel like we just did this, but I guess that's what happens when you only play two games in a series. So it's time for another series preview as the Cardinals head home for a nice long homestand kicked off by a visit from the Philadelphia Phillies. Now, there was some surprise, I think, when the Phillies landed at free agent Jake Arrieta over the offseason. The Cardinals had long been tied to rumors about the former Cub, although nothing substantial because they clearly only had eyes for Miles Michaelis. But as the Fightin' Phils tried to work their way back from a 66-96 and season in 2017, the pressure was already a little bit high for Gabe Kapler in his managerial debut season. The inexperience might have showed early on, but as the dust settled, so too did the Phillies. Or so it seems. But they've gotten off to good starts before, so is this one for real? Liz Rocher, managing editor at The Good Fight, joins me to discuss that and more. Well, Liz, first of all, thank you for joining me. How are you? I'm doing great. How are you? I'm good. The sun is shining. There's baseball happening that's not in the snow, which seemed like it was never going to happen for a <laughs> while For a while this spring, so I, I can't complain too much about it. <laughs> Same. So the Cardinals welcoming the Phillies to St. Louis. Now, there's plenty of history between these two teams, but I, I want to talk about the 2018 version of the Phillies because um, brought in some new faces. Obviously, this is the Gabe Kepler era, which has the potential to be very exciting, but sometimes that excitement doesn't always translate onto the field. So before we get too deep into who's doing what and who's hitting where heading into this series, what's kind of your early season report on the Gabe Kapler era? Uh, it's mostly positive. You know, everybody, for the most part, seems happy. Um, everyone's doing well. The team is gelling. You know, there it's a very exciting time to be a Phillies fan for the first time in a number of years. Uh, it's exciting to watch them um, and kind of not automatically chalk up every game they play to a loss before they take the field. Uh, so my early season report is pretty good. Specifically talking about the management situation this year, what have you liked? What have you seen that um, you can attribute to what Gabe Kepler is doing with these guys? Um, well, he has a lot to juggle. He has, there are too many position players, uh, at least when everyone's healthy, there are too many to fit into all the positions they have. Um, because there's no designated hitter, you sort of have to make the choice every night, you know, who sits and who plays. Um, he's done sort of a good job. You know, he, he promised everybody playing time and it's almost coming true, but you know, Nick Williams is not getting a lot of playing time. He's one of our outfielders that came over. Uh, in the Cole Hamels trade back in 2015. Um, he's been great as a pinch hitter, but uh, he hasn't really gotten a lot of starting opportunities. Um, and that's disappointing. Um, but beyond that, you know, part of it's just the gelling, his attitude, his general attitude. He sort of, he seems to lead with a strong hand, but without letting anybody know that's what he's doing. Because, you know, Leaders have formed in the clubhouse. You know, he doesn't really set rules. He wants the players to do that. And that's a really, I think that's a positive development. On the negative side, you can kind of tell when he's worried, really, really worried about losing a game. When he starts putting in relievers, when he just starts switching them out, you know, like old school, old school style, just really excessively matchy matchy and it's it's frustrating because you can tell he's clenching very hard on the game he really doesn't want to lose and he's just making it impossible because he doesn't trust his relievers yeah and the Phillies have a decent bullpen I wanted to talk about that bullpen so while we're there we might as well just uh just keep going with that um Cardinals fans will be would be familiar with Pat Neshek if he was actually pitching and healthy right yes. now um but he would have been kind of a veteran presence in that bullpen um I think that bullpen management seems to be that kicker for new managers that they either uh they they either try to overmanage um or they try or or they're just they don't make those right moves uh and i i started chuckling when you mentioned the uh incessant relief pitchers because it seems like that's a a pretty common early managerial career 
approach to just try to do too much. But when you look at the bullpen that the Phillies have right now, as you said, there are a lot of guys that are capable out there. Um, the, the, the end of games has been a little bit tricky, at least lately. And I was just noting that, that Gabe Kapler, who seems to really embrace this idea of creativity and this new approach to baseball and not always doing things the same old, same old way, hasn't necessarily followed through with that in the bullpen to this point. Is that fair to say? That's true. I mean, at one point during one interview, he said, you know, the last three outs of the game, those are Hector Neris's outs. I'm like, that's not how this is supposed to work. You know, there are a number of guys in the bullpen, I think, who could at least audition. You know, Hector Neris's problem is that he's allowing too many men on base, and then those men are scoring. And, like, I'm looking at his his um his line right now and I mean there's nine walks in 15 innings it's it's not looking good there's 15 hits there you go it's a hit printing that's the problem um <laughs> like where's the it. issue that'll do it <laughs> there it is it's like a 5.17 ERA it's really bad and you know I don't know what the issue is with him but he's just allowing too many men on base and you can put those relievers in the middle of the game. You can't put them at the very end because then there's no time left for anything else to happen. You can't fix it if you're closing out the game and, you know, you allow two base runners and one of them scores. So I would like Gabe Kapler to start trying some other stuff. Um, I, I think he's going to. We haven't had much of a chance to see it because the Phillies have been rained out twice in the past, like, four or five days. So. It, it, he's had a lot of time to think about it, is what's happened. <laughs> Which may or may not be a good thing. I know that uh, when Mike Matheny has too much time to think about his version of creativity, it tends to result in a lot of head-scratching. Uh, yeah. So maybe maybe Gabe's a little uh, less of a head-scratcher than that. But this idea of a closer by committee keeps coming up. Um, the Cardinals have sort of toyed with that. I mean, they started the season without a closer signed to the team. They signed Greg Holland to be the closer on opening day, and he's been anything but closer caliber since then. So um, they've sort of unofficially took that approach at the beginning of the year as they watched Bud Norris kind of lay claim to that role. And I guess that's what I wanted to get to was this idea that there are a lot of guys in the Phillies bullpen that, that could pitch in the ninth inning. Does this idea that it could be any one of those guys on any given night seem to be something that is sustainable or does it just sort of naturally fall into this is the guy that's done the best in that role? Well, I think it's easy for a manager to fall into that because it's what's always been done. Um, I, I don't see a problem with doing closer by committee because, you know, it's going to end up coming down. Like if you restrict it to just one guy in the ninth inning, I find, I think that's restrictive. But if you have, you know, the two or three guys who have done the best of the last few games, you know, you use them in the, you know, the eighth and the ninth and you give someone else a chance in the sixth and see what they do. You know, I feel like it can be a give and a take, you know, there are naturally going to be guys that fall into roles for a certain time. But I don't think it has to be, you know, this guy goes here all the time. Like, you can put him in the eighth inning if it's a higher leverage situation. You know, if you've just got, you know, if, you're, if you've got one run up on the opponent, you know, you, you want someone who's going to stop that right then. You know, don't allow any room. And guys are going to naturally fall into those roles. But I don't want it to just be them like just don't put them in boxes because a bullpen is huge and has a lot of different like modern bullpens are enormous why are why is it that way if you're just going to use the same two or three guys in the same spots forever yeah the the cardinals have been rocking an eight-man bullpen uh for most of the season as mm -hmm. uh the security blanket for mike Matheny, who always likes to have that one guy um just in case uh, in case you know disaster strikes. I don't know. We, we haven't been able to figure it out for the last several <laughs> years. Uh, but that guy seems to be always there, um, other than a couple of weeks where they brought up an extra bench bat. So I understand that uh, that bullpen puzzle gets a little complicated. Um, maybe 
unnecessarily when you're you're too resistant to using guys as the situation calls for, as opposed to maybe arbitrary roles. Uh, but as you look at who those guys are in the bullpen, who stands out to you? Who's made the the biggest impression early on this year? Adubre Ramos has been incredible. He's um, got he's he's been in the bullpen for a few years and. He has some ups and downs. He's been really solid. Uh, he has one save, which seems wrong. He, I feel like he should get more opportunities. Um, you know, he does walk guys every now and then, and eventually it will come to catch him. But why not ride? Why not ride the wave while he's hot, I would say. Um, Yaxel Rios has been really good. There are guys in the uh, who are on the disabled list right now. Victor Arano, who started the season with an incredible run of uh, batters retired, um, and Adam Morgan is is a good sort of sixth, seventh inning guy, maybe eighth inning. I think they sort of have been trying to figure out who plays the setup role, and like it can be all of them at any time. Um, and then there's the newest addition, which is Sir Anthony Dominguez, who has been in the Philly system for a few years. He is, he was converted to a reliever just this spring training. He'd been a starter for a while and, uh, he's really, really good as a reliever. He throws really fast. Uh, Tommy Hunter kind of sucks. The <laughs> Phillies are paying him a lot of money to just sort of be there and suck right now. I think he has the... Actually, he has the second highest ERA in the bullpen underneath Hector Neris, the closer. <laughs> so that's good. That's, that's totally yeah, it's how all, it all be. looking really great. <laughs> I feel like every bullpen has that one guy that you're like, cool, we're stuck with this guy all season, and he forgot how to get, how to get guys out. <laughs> well, it's like it, it would prove that all of this is just a big crapshoot. No one oh, really knows what they're doing. Like for sure. The fact that you can have a bullpen with like two dudes that have ERAs over five, but every now and then they deliver a full inning. Like it's just, none of it makes sense. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. It's no wonder that that's the hardest part of a a manager's job. I think Um, switching gears a little bit, let's talk offensively with this team as they've sort of started to gel into who this version of the Phillies are. Who's the face of this team? That's a really good question. Um, and I think you can't really put one face on it right now because it's it's Reese Hoskins and Odubel Herrera, who are young, incredibly talented, um, and have done incredible things in short amounts of time. For the longest time, Odubel Herrera was the only player the Phillies had under long term contract. He was the like the only one. Now I think he's one of four, four or five, I think, long term. But he was the first. They locked him up immediately. Um, yeah, Odubo Herrera is incredible. He's so much fun to watch. He is really talented. He's always challenging himself. He's never satisfied. He's got really great hair. I can't <laughs> complain about him at all. I'm a I'm a sucker for good hair myself, so I, I understand. Um, <laughs> actually, one of the, the potential starters for the, one of the last two games this season uh, will likely be John Gant. Um, and he actually came to the sort of the Cardinals fan fest thing over the winter with this like luxurious romance <laughs> novel model hair. Uh, and by spring That's training, great. he had buzzed it all off and I was no. devastated. <laughs> um, so there's sort of this running joke uh, about me and, and players with fantastic hair, mostly yep. because of John Gant. So I hear you. <laughs> um, no, but as far as, uh, as far as Herrera is concerned, he's becoming, I think more and more one of those guys that you hear about just baseball wide, even when you're not necessarily paying attention to the Phillies. Um, I think I noted today, he actually got a hit in the first inning against the Orioles to extend his on base streak. It's at what, like 42 games now, something like that. Oh, something yes. ridiculous. I, they're playing right now. I hadn't checked. So he's already extended his on base streak. Yes. yes. It's been, it's been, he hasn't kept me biting my nails. <laughs> yeah. like watching it's nice to game. get that out of the way in the first inning. Yeah. <laughs> For the last few games, he's got it done right away in the first inning so I can breathe easy. Like it's, at, th- at this point, I only care about him inching up the list because he, I think he's like, I think fourth all time for the Phillies right now. It's nice to have a guy like that 
that, like I said, is getting sort of baseball wide recognition. Um, for a long time, I've felt like the Cardinals were missing sort of that marquee player. And, yeah. uh, you know, for obviously it was Albert Pujols for a decade. Um, the Cardinals have great legends that are household names, whether you're a Cardinals fan or not. At this point, outside of maybe Yadier Molina, most people probably oh, don't recognize the Cardinals uh, on name only, which is something that I think Herrera is starting to bring to the Phillies. Yeah. I mean, I, I hadn't thought about that until you just mentioned it, but I'm like, they've always just been a great red wall of annoyingness for Phillies fans. <laughs> and, you know, there are individual players that were especially annoying during that championship run where they beat the Phillies and <laughs> made me cry. Um you know, Yadier Molina, I think, is the one. He's not the only one left, which is kind of stunning. The, I feel like the Cardinals have, like, a, a, a weird balance of very old and very young with, like, a bunch of stuff in the middle. Yeah, that's a that's a pretty fair assessment. I mean, there, it's been primarily the same core for a while now. Um, you know, they'll, they'll lose a guy like Matt Holiday and then bring in someone like Marcelo Zuna. Um, but for the most part, it, it hasn't really changed that dynamic too much as far as, you know, who the young upstart that's going to take over and, and be the face of the organization. Um, that's been one of my complaints about this team for the last couple of years is they don't have that, uh, kind of franchise player, but they've, they've made some changes this year. Uh, in that direction, but uh, they do not have uh, an Odubel Herrera. Let's just put it that way. <laughs> but outside of Herrera, um, is there someone right now that maybe isn't getting all the headlines, that maybe doesn't have uh, the the very highest of praise from the Phillies sort of fans in general, but that you think deserves a, a little bit more of a shout out than they're getting right now? I mean... I can't count Aaron Nola, who's been incredible. I think people we want to are, talk are about him too. So <laughs> yes, they're starting to talk about him. But um, I'll say, like the Phillies have a handful of players that started off really badly and have started to very slowly rebound. Like Carlos Santana was atrocious for the you know the first thirty games of the of the season for the first month plus, um, and he was a lot of it was luck. A lot of it was just really bad luck because he was hitting the ball hard, but, you know, he'd hit it hard and it would die in that horrible outfield at Marlins Park, you know, and, you know, it was frustrating to watch. And so lately he's finally started to get hits through and it, he's looked really good. Um, Michael Franco has been also great over at third base that he's everyone is always wondering, is this for real? Because he's had two bad, bad seasons after having one very good one. And he looks like he's sort of finally rebounding. And I'm desperate for him to keep it up because I, I, I love him. He's really great. Looking at this series with the Cardinals and the Phillies for four games in St. Louis, let's talk a little bit about, well, the pitchers we know they'll see, which is half of the series. Um, a, a number of rainouts, like you mentioned, for uh, for the Phillies, and then just some injuries and rotation changes for the Cardinals. But the first two games should be Velasquez versus Weaver. Second game will be Arietta versus Waka. Now, on Velasquez, for a quick second, um, <laughs> did he, like, secretly have surgery over the offseason that no one knew it's, about? Is that a thing, or is that not a thing? <laughs> it's unclear. He had an issue with numbness in his finger, uh, and that's something everyone knew about. And then a, a report on Philly voice, which does not have a beat writer anymore. Um, came out that ha misquoted, I believe Velasquez as saying that he had gotten a rib removed. That is not apparently what he said. He did not have a rib removed. Um, so it's not totally, I, I don't think it's totally clear what type of surgery he had, but he had something done. And, now he's fine because it wasn't as serious as a rib removed, which is what, you know, I think we've seen a number of those and I don't think any of them have really come back full force ever. 
Yeah, I mean, Chris Carpenter had that surgery. Uh, Jaime Garcia had that surgery, which is funny that that he's one of those guys on that list because he is also a guy that kind of that kind of did that to the Cardinals. Um, like he opted to have surgery without telling anyone, and then was like, "P.S. I'm having surgery." <laughs> <laughs> um, so it was funny to me that he's on that list in this now very convoluted story about what may or may not have happened uh, with Velasquez and and. Not thoracic outlet syndrome, but kind of. <laughs> yeah, it's it's confusing. <laughs> it, it's all confusing. I mean, and the most I can chalk it up to is that, I mean, the uh, the guy at Philly Voice got something wrong, and now everything is confusing. Yeah, that's a, a strange story that um, probably can be relatively erased by performance. So th- surgery or no surgery aside... Where is he this year as far as what the expectations are or what you anticipate seeing from him in this outing? The expectations are for him to be a functional back and, you know, back end of the rotation starter. You know, that's, it's, I don't believe that's too much to ask. He can throw really fast. But sometimes he throws and it feels like he doesn't know where the ball is going. He's just sort of hurling it. You know, he's changed a lot in the last year. He's matured a lot. Last year when he was doing badly, he was very hard on himself. He was very hard on himself in the press. And it was really sad to see. You know, he's just sort of like, I, you know, I let everybody down. I let my teammates down. I let the fans down. I let myself down. I'm like, stop it. It's just like really calm down. 162 games a year, you're going to get, you know, 25 of them, something like that. So, you know, now he's sort of like, I just need to learn from every outing. You know, I need to find, you know, where I'm making mistakes. It's a lot more productive. And so that in and of itself is really great because the less pressure he puts on himself, the better. Because I think some of the problems he's having is just mental. You know, when he's pitching, he starts to panic. You know, he tries to get to fine wants to get the strikeout. The Phillies have been focusing on soft contact all year. Like Jake Arietta has changed himself as a pitcher. Yeah, I wanted to talk about Arietta because um, you know, he was out there for a long time this offseason. A lot of people thought the Cardinals might make a run at him. Um, you know, he came in and he's one of those guys that I feel like he can be tremendous. He can also be a disaster yep. at times. So, <laughs> the Orioles way. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, the, I, I wonder what my expectations would have been of him had the Cardinals made that move. But when he went to the Phillies, it seemed like it was a little bit of a surprise. But how has he adapted? Because, um, you know, there was, I think, a lot of pressure being one of the top free agent pitchers to go so late in the offseason and then come into a Phillies team that's really trying to to prove itself as a contender. He's adapted really well. Um, I was concerned a lot because there had been some flashes of weirdness. His velocity had gone down. You know, his 2017 wasn't all that great. I don't, I don't think. Um, and my concern was, you know, what are, what do pitchers do when they start to get older and can't hit the same number on the gun anymore? Because you can either just completely flame out and have, you know, have nothing to do and go to the bullpen or just get out of baseball, or you can figure out how to adapt. Like Jonathan Papelbon, who I hate still to this day, um, was able to do that in his last few years with the Phillies. He lost a few, at least a few miles per hour um, off of all of his pitches, and he was incredibly effective still. And Jake Arrieta has adapted and done a whole lot more. He's lots of soft contact. His strikeouts are are down. Like it, people were looking of, at that and being very concerned, and you know I'm not. Like he's unless he's allowing eight thousand runs to cross the plate. You know I'm fine with him allowing soft contact because that's how you avoid the home run. You know what the the balance of what's happening in baseball right now is really interesting because the strikeouts are up, but I maintain it's not because pitchers are any better. I think it's just because every hitter has changed the way they approach and they don't care if they, if they hit the ball anymore, they want to hit it far. And so the alternative is either hit it far or don't hit it, (laughs) swing right through it. 
So I, it's interesting to see Phillies pitchers take a completely different approach. Yeah, I, I think for a long time the Cardinals were that pitch-to-contact team. Um, mm-hmm. They sort of got away from that and then brought Mike Maddox in, who's not quite as much of a pitch-to-contact guy. Um, so they were kind of that old-school pitching style for a while, um, and they've sort of tried to catch up to, to where the rest of baseball is, it seems, with uh, with a change in mentality and approach. But I I agree in that I think there's nothing wrong with pitching to contact as long as you're doing it in a way that's effective um, and that you have a defense behind you that's capable of handling a pitcher who pitches to contact because um, the Cardinals got into a little bit of trouble with that last year with uh, an infield defense that was kind of a disaster all all season uh to put it to put it bluntly um and that tends to ruin the pitch to contact plan very quickly but as far as Arietta is concerned um I think he always to me was that guy that had still had the potential to be really really good um but like you said was probably going to have to do it in a different way which seems to be what he's done now in those last two games of the series as I mentioned still um don't know who's going to pitch those two games. For the Cardinals, it will not be Adam Wainwright or uh, Carlos Martinez, both of whom are now on the DL. It looked like Carlos Martinez was at first only going to miss one start, um, but now they're saying his uh, his progress has slowed and he won't likely be back for the weekend. So odds are, as I mentioned, John Gant, sans glorious hair, will get, uh, we'll get one of those starts. It is. It's so sad. Um, and then we'll see who ends up picking up that uh, that next start over the weekend. You mentioned earlier Aaron Nola. Uh, whether or not he gets one of those starts notwithstanding, I think we need to talk about him for a minute. Um, another guy that seems to be gaining some steam as far as people taking note of what he's doing. Uh, I read a piece that you wrote about him the other day, and I kind of just want to let you introduce the world <laughs> to Aaron Nola. <laughs> he's very good. You know, he... He's able to, you know, there are some days when he does the pitch to contact thing. He, but recently he pitched, you know, seven innings and he you know, twelve strikeouts, which was a career high uh, for a single game. He's he's just really, really good. He's completely come into his own. You know, there is oh, there have been questions because he's been injured on and off. Um, about whether or not he has the capability to be sort of an ace pitcher. And he, he's better than Arietta. He's the best pitcher on the team. He was, he was a first round draft pick, but I, I think he was seventh or eighth, or maybe it was even further down. I don't remember, but you know, the Phillies promoted him in 2015 and this sort of feels like the, you know, the fruition of all of that, because he had, I think, a great first season. His next season, he was sort of injured. He, there was more injury. If he can stay off the disabled list this year, he's he's one of the best pitchers in baseball right now. And, you know, I he can get, he can face any team. I'd like to see him face the Astros. I'd like <laughs> to see that happen, because I'm not a huge fan of the Astros. I'd like to see him face them and sit everybody down. I think that there's a a lot of conversation about the Astros these days um, with the pitching that they're putting out there for a different reason, but that's not the point. Uh, (laughs) It's always exciting to see someone like that come up and and do things that not everyone's capable of. I think that's why, for me, Carlos Martinez is so exciting because um, he does things that not everybody can do, and he can do that when he has his best stuff, which is comparable to the best in the game, I think, when he's when he's at his best. But he can do that when he doesn't have his best stuff as well and just find a way to get it done, which I think is um, the real tell in someone who can, can create a career for themselves long term as opposed to just being a guy that throws really hard for a while and then doesn't know what to do with it. <laughs> exactly. That's exactly right. That, you know, guys who know how to have great starts when they're not pitching their best. Like that happened with Aaron Nola last time out. It was six innings. He, I think he allowed just one run, but a bunch of hits. But he, you know, he got it done. He gave the Phillies a chance to win. So, you know, those are those are the pitchers that can be aces and can be around for a while. Always exciting to see, unless, you know, you're a fan of the opponent facing one of those pitchers. <laughs> and right now, uh, the Cardinals are, uh, the run scoring is... A bit of an issue. So uh, 
as a fan of that team, um, I don't know that I, I want to see how bad it could get against a, a pitcher who is uh, quite that capable. But we'll see what happens. The Cardinals, um, their lineup right now is is struggling to figure it out. You mentioned some of the bad luck, um, kind of the, the hitting right at people that was going on for a few of the Phillies hitters. That's the, that's the case for a number of Cardinals hitters right now, Matt Carpenter in particular. Um, but there's this growing angst, I think, about uh, Matt Carpenter and Dexter Fowler, Marcelo Zuna not really putting up the numbers that everyone expected of him. Um, and and we'll see what happens because uh, it, it doesn't seem to make much difference whether it's a Clayton Kershaw type pitcher or a kid making his major league debut right now, uh, it's again, a bit of a crapshoot as far as whether or not the Cardinals are going to put up any runs. So, um, looking forward to this Philly series, uh, where can people find you and see, uh, all of your work? Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Liz Rocher, uh, all one word, it's R O S C H E R. Um, I write on The Good Fight, which is P-H-I-G-H-T, thegoodfight.com. You can also find me over on Yahoo Sports. I write a lot about baseball, but also about really anything else, football, basketball. Um, I've done wrestling. (laughs) I've done a little bit of everything. So uh, that is where you can find me. All right. Well, I appreciate your time today, and uh, we'll, I'm sure, see you on Twitter over the remainder of the weekend. (laughs) Absolutely. Thanks so much for having me on. Well, the Cardinals certainly have their work cut out for them as they head home with a problem on their hands. How to score runs when three or four or five of the guys in your regular lineup are struggling to get on base, put balls in play, and produce runs on a regular basis, it doesn't matter who they face. The task is pretty great. So the Cardinals will look to get back on track, look to start solving some of these offensive dilemmas, while the Phillies look to continue their success with some of their young talent and some of their future superstars. Looking at you, Odubel Herrera. I'm Tara Wellman. Don't forget to subscribe to me on YouTube, to Birds on the Black on iTunes, and follow us all on Twitter so that you don't ever miss anything. Thanks again to Liz for joining me. I'll see you next time.